Good morning. It is a joy to be with you. Brian had me preach all the service today, and I'm so thankful that he was able to, that, I, that he could have a, a Sunday where he could be me and I could be him. Um, but it's a joy. Royal Family Kids Camp, pretty awesome, huh? The testimony today. I've had the opportunity to listen to everyone's testimony because I've been at all services. And, um, it, you know, listening to their testimonies, experience of the week I had there, it reminded me of something Tony Campolo shared in a sermon he did uh, years back about a uh, trip he took to an Eastern European country. And it happened to be a country that was uh, dealing with a lot of child prostitution. And he was checking into the hotel and a girl, 10, 11 years old, about the age of our oldest at Royal Family Kids Camp, approached him and asked if if he wanted to buy her for the night. And he engaged her, asked her how much she was, and she told him. And as they were um, having this interaction, he noticed that her friend was kind of hiding in the shadows. So he called her out too. And he asked how much for the both of them. And they gave gave him the number and uh, he said, okay, come to my hotel room at 9 o'clock tonight and we're going to have a lot of fun. So they agreed to that and uh, 9 o'clock came and what these girls didn't know is that before that time, Tony Campola ran out to buy pizza and rent Walt Disney movies. And they spent the next three hours together laughing, eating pizza and watching Walt Disney movies. And somebody kind of uh, curmudged and gave him some ridicule for it. And they said, you know, what difference does that make? You know, once they were done with you, they're just going to go back out to the street and prostitute themselves again. And Tony, I thought, made a really profound statement. He said, you know, maybe so, but for three hours, they had the chance to be a kid again. You know, many of the kids we work with at Royal Family Kids Camp are deeply wounded kids. But church, for one week, they have the chance to be a kid again. And praise be to God for that. Will you join me in prayer as we uh, start our, our reflection on this morning's uh, word? Let us pray. Almighty God, I just thank you so much for this opportunity you've given all of us to kind of gather as a community of faith, a faith family, Lord, to sing your praises, uh, to present ourselves as living sacrifices, Lord, and now to just kind of dig into your word and, and hear a few reflections on this word that is life-giving. I just pray now, God, that you bless the words of my lips, the meditation of all our hearts, that they be of profit to us and, and maybe more importantly, acceptable to you for you indeed are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Lord, well, we're in the midst of a summer series, seven weeks in now, on the book of Proverbs. And we're calling this series Advice from a Friend. And throughout this series, we've been hitting a number of just real-life topics, have we not? Uh, topics that have dealt with our finances, how we rear our children, how we conduct our sexual lives. I'm so glad Brian was on that day for all, for all four services. Um, other things, staying sober, you know, how to balance all of life's influences. And last week we talked about you know, watching our mouth, the use of our tongue, and really how we, the tongue is a powerful thing that can bring life or, or kill, right? And we have to be careful, not careless, with the way we use our tongue. Anyway, something I hope that is being impressed upon you throughout this series is that the biblical writers were not only concerned with the afterlife, as if our time here on planet Earth is just a waiting game until we graduate into the heavenly realms. Now, don't get me wrong, the Bible speaks a lot about heaven, speaks a lot about the kingdom of God, you know, what we hope for and what we get excited about. Uh, you know, friends, if I can take us off on a rabbit chair just for a moment. For those of us who are in Christ, we have no fear of death, amen? No, we believe in resurrection. You know, we believe there will be a day when there is no more death, when there is no more pain, when there is no more heartache, when there is no more violence, when there is no more war. And in light of all that we're dealing with, not only in our country but the world right now, that is really good news, isn't it? The world needs to hear this message. You know, heaven is that place when in time when Christ, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords will reign victoriously and forever. Amen. But again, the biblical writers were not only concerned about the afterlife. No, they were very much concerned, almost equally concerned with the here and now, how we do life today. Uh, They were adamant about, in particular Solomon with Proverbs, adamant about imparting wisdom to future generations on how best to conduct life this side of heaven. So that's the first impression I hope you're getting, you're gaining over the, the, the series that we're seven weeks into now. Proverbs is a practical book. It's a how-to book. It's a helpful resource for any and everything that we experience in the here and now. The other thing Proverbs offers to us, church, is a clear pathway to what we all desire. And what do we all desire? 
Well, to, to live happy and joy-filled lives, do we not? You know, all throughout Proverbs, we are constantly being offered contrasting directions in life. You know, one leads us down a road towards death and destruction and brokenness, and the other leads us down a road towards happiness and joy. Now, the path of destruction and death is taken by what Solomon calls the fool. Well, who's the fool? Well, it's the person who dismisses the wisdom of Scripture, who dismisses the, the, the words of Solomon. Now, the road of happiness and joy is taken by who Solomon calls the wise, the ones who bend their ear to the advice of a friend, who, who take and listen to the counsel of Solomon and the, the other writers of the Scriptures. You know, church, let, let me speak a reality today. Every morning we wake up, we enter into a world of voices competing for our attention, do we not? You know, when we arise from our slumber, our culture, our neighbors, our politicians, newscasters, uh, talk show hosts, pastors, strangers even, are filling our heads with advice on how to live a better life, how to, how to live a more satisfying and fulfilling life. Now, with that said, I firmly believe that unless that advice, that wisdom is, is rooted in biblical authority, it's going to eventually disappoint. If not completely disappoint, it's going to at least be incomplete. As Solomon calls, it's going to kind of be a, a chasing after the wind. So again, this summer, we have been working together to, toward learning the wisdom necessary to help us walk, as Eugene Peterson says, to help us walk through, safely and securely through the seductive streets of life. Now, would you believe that the biblical wisdom offered to us uh, on, on how to live a happy and joyful life has a lot to do with how we relate to and interact and help the poor? It has to do with, with how we interact with the person standing on the street corner holding a sign begging for food. It has to do with how we manage our businesses. It has to do with how we orchestrate and use our personal finances. It has to do with how we give of our time, our treasures, and our talents. Listen to some of these Proverbs. Um, how they talk about how we need to relate and help the poor in order to attain the joy and happy life that we so desire. Listen to some of these Proverbs. Proverbs 14. Those who oppress the poor insult their maker. It's probably not a good thing to insult God, right? But those who are kind to the needy honor him. Proverbs 22. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. And finally, Proverbs 28. The greedy person stirs up strife, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be enriched. Whoever gives to the poor will lack, hear this, nothing, but one who turns a blind eye will get many a curse. Word of God for the people of God. Hear it, believe it, and live. You know, something that is made, at least in my mind, starkly apparent as we read really not only Proverbs but the entirety of the biblical story is the importance of how we treat one another, how we care for one another, and again, how we speak to one another. The other reality that is blatantly apparent, at least to me, is God's concern for the poor, the downtrodden, and about how those of us with means help and care for them. Uh, Jim Wallace, a, a social activist and author, uh, says it this way. He says, The Bible insists that the best test of a nation's righteousness, let's bring it home, the best test of a church's righteousness is in how it treats the poorest and most vulnerable in its midst. You know, I, I see this over and over as I read through the Proverbs. Those who have something, church, have a responsibility to give to those who have nothing. Again, I read this over and over in the Bible. The blessings we receive are not meant to be hoarded, but rather given away. We're blessed in order to be a blessing. Uh, 1,600 years ago, there's this guy named St. Basil the Great. Wouldn't you love to be called the Great? 
Maybe someday I'll be Jared the Great. I, I don't know. Anyways, St. Basil the Great, uh, it was a church reformer. Uh, really, we have a lot to thank him and his brother and friend from the Cappadocia region of Turkey for hammering out what we believe as Christians, our, our creeds, our doctrines, our orthodoxy. Anyways, in a sermon St. Basil preached, he talked about this very topic we're talking about today. How about really the resources we attain are not ours alone, but rather they're meant to be used to lift up the lowly. Now this morning we prayed the Lord's Prayer, and part of that prayer is give us today our daily bread. You know, we understand bread is a necessity of life, not only what we eat, but, but drink and shelter and food. Those are the necessities of life. We understand them to be corporate products, but they're also communal responsibility. We have to care for those who don't have food, water, clothing, and clothes, or, or, or shelter. Anyway, St. Basil says this about what we're talking about today. He says, the bread that is spoiling in your house belongs to the hungry. The shoes that are mildewing under your bed belong to those who have none. The clothes stored away in your trunk belong to those who are naked. And the money that is depreciating in your treasury belongs to the poor. And not only do I find that to be personally convicting, because I am a person who lives out of my abundance, but it also reminds me of a story that Jesus told that Dave read this morning about a rich guy who one year had a surplus of crop. Remember this story from 10 minutes ago? <laughs> had a surplus of crop and he didn't know what to do with it. So he tears down his smaller barns and builds bigger ones for himself. To which Jesus, do you remember what Jesus calls him? He says, you fool. You fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. And the things you have prepared for yourself, whose then will they be? And he ends by saying, so it is with those who store up treasures on earth but are not rich toward God and neighbor. You know, in, in terms of helping the poor or hoarding our stuff, I think Jesus gives us a very direct answer, does he not? As our Proverbs say this morning, the, the eternal state of our soul, friends, isn't improved by bursting barns by new cars or new homes. Our happiness and joy isn't found in the quantity of drink and food around our dinner table, nor are the most profound realities in life this side of heaven enlarged by material successes or money. In fact, again, Jesus calls this man what? A fool. A fool because he chose to take the path that led towards death and destruction. A fool because he remembered the wrong things. And what did he remember? Well, himself. And not only did he remember the wrong things, he forgot the essential things. What are the essential things? Well, namely your neighbor and also time. He forgot about his neighbor. You know, if this man's barns were too small to hold all his crap, well, let's think out loud here. You think there are people in the community that'd be willing to get that surplus off his hand? You know, feed their belly or the bellies of those who are hungry in that community? Yes. He forgot about his neighbor. He also forgot about time. He forgot one of the realities we all have in common. You know what that is? Every one of us has an expiration date. <laughs> you know? This fool, it never occurred to this fool that there was possibly an end to his life. You know, there's this old story uh, about three apprentice devils who were um, heading up to, from hell to earth to kind of wreak havoc on humanity. And as they were passing through the gates of hell to get there, um, they passed by Satan. And they offered up to Satan, you know, their proposal of how they were going to kind of mess with, with human beings. And the first devil says, well, I'm going to tell man that there's no God. And Satan says, that's not going to work. I mean, man knows in his heart that, that there is a God. Well, the second devil says, well, I'm going to tell man that there is no hell. Satan said, that's even more hopeless. Why? Well, because man, even in this life, has have experienced both the remorse and the regret of hell. And the third devil says to Satan, I'll tell them that there is no hurry. To which Satan smiled and said, go. If you tell them that, you will ruin them by the millions. You know, I think when it comes to helping the poor, lifting up the lowly, I don't think the problem we have as human beings is the desire or the intention, especially in a place like a church. I mean, I think we all have this in desire and intention to help the poor out, to, to lift up the lowly, to, to give to those in need. 
Well, that's not the problem. I think the problem we struggle with is when. Oftentimes we think, you know, tomorrow is a better day to help them today. Or we think, you know, when I'm in a better position or when I have freed up more time or when I have more resources, then I'll help. And yet, i got to ask the question, isn't that not the intention and the desire of the man Jesus calls fool? For friends, hear me. If you've missed anything, tune in just for this one second. You are in the position to help the poor today. The time is now. And the resources that you already have can and will make a difference. You know, I have um, been serving at Church of the Lakes now for over a year. July 1st was my anniversary, so I'm in the year two, praise God. And something I'm really appreciative about our faith family, honestly, collectively, is all the different opportunities we have to help the poor, to get our hands dirty doing good, to lift up the lowly. Some of those opportunities that are uh, given to us, uh, we know these, but I'm just going to kind of recite them anyways. Royal Family Kids Camp. You know, it's a ministry that, that lifts up foster kids and ministers to them and shares with them the love of Christ. A Habitat for Humanity. This summer we're building a home uh, for a woman named Charlene and her son Landon. Uh, Another opportunity our church offers to helping the poor is Calvary Mission in Cannes, Ohio. You know, every week we offer an abundance of food, particularly meat, perishable food, to the Gibbs neighborhood uh, to feed, feed their hungry bellies. And one more, Um, six months from now, we're going to gather in this place by the thousands, right, for Christmas Eve services. And during our service, we take an offering. And some of you may not know this, that offering does not go into church coffers or bank accounts. No, all we receive, 100% of what we receive is given back out to missions, both locally and globally, to help the poor, to help those in need. Now, these are just some of the many opportunities our church provides for you and me to help the poor. But hear me. One, this isn't an exhaustive list. There's a lot more. But two, these aren't the only ways you personally, you individually, me personally and individually, can help people in need. Did you hear our good muse moment from Claire about Royal Family Kids Camp this week and watch the video? Did that inspire you? Did that stir your souls? Is that a ministry you want to get involved in? That's great. But what do you do in the meantime? I mean, camp's a year away. Here's an idea. A month from now, go to your local schools and and sign up to be a tutor. Help some kids who are really struggling in reading, writing, and arithmetic to get get ahead in their class. Or or maybe sign up to be a big brother or big sister. And mentor a young person who has kind of drifted towards the road of destruction and death and, and help them kind of get back on the road towards joy and happiness. I don't know, maybe you're so inspired and you feel this stirring in your soul so deeply that you yourself want to be a foster parent. That's awesome. Start the process. In fact, there are people in our church who are foster parents and I'm sure would love to sit down and talk to you about the joys and the frustrations of that very important ministry that we have in our culture. You would love to build our Habitat House? That's great. Listen, go online, sign up, Every Saturday from now until October, there is opportunity for you to go and help. But Saturdays don't work for you? I get that. I got an idea. Go mow your elderly neighbor's lawn down the road. Weed her flower beds. Better yet, come over to my house and weed my (laughs) flower beds. I I don't know. You can't physically help prepare and serve meat for Calvary Mission on, on Wednesdays, but you're a person of financial means. Listen, that, ch- that ministry could use your monetary gifts today to help keep that vibrant and effective ministry uh, afloat in-, in Canton, Ohio. Look again, I'm not offering every idea of how you can help and I can help the poor, how we can use our time, treasures, and talents to make a difference in someone's life. But what I want to stress this morning is this. I don't want any of us to make the assumption that somebody else is going to fill that need. That somebody else is going to provide for the needs of the poor. I don't want you to make that assumption. Friends, you and me collectively, but you and me as individuals have the responsibility to step up and fill need, not tomorrow, but today. Remember, as our Proverbs this morning speak to, 
Where do we find happiness and joy in life? It's not in helping ourselves, it's in helping the poor. It's not in hoarding our resources, it's in giving it away. It's not in squandering our time, but using it to lift up the lowly. You know, I mentioned at the start of my message that uh, the Bible isn't solely about the afterlife. Do you remember that? I mean, Brian and I both have been saying it every week now for seven weeks, and we're starting to sound like a broken record. The Bible isn't solely about the afterlife. So much of what we learn in the Holy Scriptures is about how best to live life in the here and now. But with that said, let me make a connection for you and end with this. You know, so often I think heaven and earth kind of meld together. Doesn't it? Let me make a bold proclamation, friends. We are the church. We are the church and we live in ways, we conduct our lives in ways that give the world around us glimpses of what heaven is supposed to look like. In a sense, the kingdom of God that we will one day live in forever and ever, amen, is the same kingdom of God that Jesus calls us, in, calls us to usher in today. And in the kingdom of God, guess what? Poverty does not exist. So I say, let the reality of God's kingdom tomorrow be our reality today. Church, no more poverty. No more want. No more desperate cries to fill hungry bellies. No more homelessness. No more hopelessness. No more poor in spirit. No more loneliness. The opportunities have been given. The time is now. And the resources that you already have can and will make a difference. To the glory of God and for the coming of his kingdom, I say amen. Let us pray. Oh, great and glorious God, we thank you, Lord, for meeting us in this place, for making your presence known. We thank you, Lord, for impressing upon our hearts, Lord, just the desire to lift up the lowly and to help the poor. Oh, Lord, instill in each of us now not only the desire to help those in need, Lord, but the conviction that fulfilling those needs is a matter of urgency. And it's not something we can put off until tomorrow. Lord, may we continue to work as a church but also as individuals to prosper your kingdom that is in heaven here on earth. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. I saw Jesus walking across the sea saw Jesus walking across the sea. I said, help me walk on the water. That's where I want to be. He said, go where your faith will take you. Now come on out to me. He said, come on out to me. So I stepped out on the water. But I wasn't sinking down I stepped out on the water But I wasn't sinking down But the winds, the waves, the waters Were stirring all around I said, help me Lord, I'm sinking Surely I will drown, I will drown Then I felt Jesus, he was holding on to my hand. Then I felt Jesus, he was holding on to my hand. He said, oh, what little faith you have, you poor and doubtful man. Rise up, put your faith in me, and surely you will stand. Now rise and stand, then I held on to Jesus. We were walking across the sea. Oh. I held on to Jesus We were walking across the sea And when I stepped back in the boat I fell upon my knees I said, surely you're the Son of God Surely you're the 
Son of God, you are the Son of God. Have mercy, have mercy on me. Jesus still is calling, come and walk with me now. Jesus still is calling, come and walk with me. Wherever faith will take you, I promise I will be. Wherever you are walking, even when you're sinking, go where your faith will take you. Rise up and walk with me. Walk with me. Rise up and walk with me.